talk about Towards Wrapped Floor Theory for Stable Generalized Complex. Uh, manifolds. Manifolds. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. So what I'm going to talk about today um, is not a completed work. So this is a new project uh, I've only recently started working on. Um, it follows on from my thesis in the sense that um, in my thesis I also stud studied uh, stable generalized complex manifolds. Um, and now uh, I'm interested in extending um, ideas from Fleur theory uh, into this context. So what I'll do is somehow motivate the setup and then give some, um, some initial results. So throughout the talk, we will be dealing with even dimensional smooth manifolds. And the setting we're interested in is stable generalized complex uh, geometry. So we've already just heard a talk about uh, generalized complex geometry, even though the, yeah, the framework in general is not spoken about very much, which I will also not do, just uh, as a brief introduction. So stable generalized complex structures are generalization of both complex and symplectic uh, structures. And these were developed by uh, Hitchin and Marco Gualtieri, who just spoke um, in the early uh, 2000s, and um, yeah, I mean, their main interest, the main interest they've generated is be precisely because symplectic manifolds and complex manifolds are somehow the extreme examples on either end of uh, generalized complex geometry. So we're at a Poisson geometry conference, uh, so I will start right by saying that whenever we have a, a generalized complex structure, so this is a map from the tangent bundle plus the cotangent bundle to itself. It is a complex structure for this vector bundle with a, a given integrability condition that I will not go into. So whenever we have one of these that induces a Poisson structure, like this. So if you want to write this as a matrix, We have a Poisson structure there in the upper right corner and then some stuff uh, in the other components. Now, um, in the case where the manifold is symplectic, here is, this is just the inverse of the symplectic structure. This entry will have the symplectic structure itself and these can be made to be zero. Um, in the case where the structure is complex, this will just be zero and there will be complex structures in these entries. But as I said, so we're interested in some uh, more general examples here. So in particular, I'm going to talk about stable generalized complex manifolds. These have the nice property that they are up to gauge equivalents still fully determined by their Poisson structure. So most, what I'm going, most of what I'm going to be saying in this talk will just be about Poisson geometry. And um, they are a very important class of examples, not least because they are actually manifolds that admit stable generalized complex structures, but admit neither complex nor symplectic structures. So one can somehow see from this that generalized complex geometry really applies to a larger class of manifolds than uh, just complex or symplectic uh, geometry. So, okay, what is this? So for a stable generalized complex structure, the induced Poisson structure will still, like for symplectic, be non-degenerate, but now not everywhere, just almost everywhere. And then there's a distinguished co-dimension two submanifold um, where pi degenerates in a particular way. So, in fact, um, generalized complex structures are examples of uh, yeah, so-called 
divisor Poisson structures or Poisson structures on uh, divisor Lie algebroids. So this somehow more general description um, was worked out by Ralph Klasse just recently. He has a preprint um, on the archive. That's about this. Um, and I'm going to, because we're going to see another type of uh, divisor Poisson structures, I'm actually going to write a little bit of the general theory. So, a divisor on a smooth M. is a line bundle together with a section such that the set where the section vanishes um, is closed and nowhere dense. In the cases where we're interested in is always a smooth submanifold, so that's what you should have in mind. Um, for what I'm going to say. Okay. So this always comes with a divisor ideal of functions. This is just the image of the sections of the dual to the line bundle um, under um, sigma. So we compare that, we compare sections of the dual with sigma and get functions. And then um, this comes with an ideal Lie algebroid. which, so whose sections um, are just the vector fields that preserve the divisor ideal. So these sections actually define a vector bundle. Um, so there's a locally free sheaf. And that immediately inherits a Lie algebraic structure. The Lie bracket just comes from restricting the Lie bracket of vector fields, and then you can work out that that actually res does restrict. Um, and the anchor is simply induced from the inclusion of these sections uh, into the vector fields. Um, so, what we can do now is consider Lie algebraic Poisson structures on this Lie algebraic. So. What do I mean by that? I simply mean sections of the alternating square of the Lie algebra such that the bracket of pi with itself is zero. So this bracket is just like for ordinary vector fields um, constructed from the Lie bracket on, on the algebra. So of course any such the algebraic Poisson structure will induce a Poisson structure, like an ordinary Poisson structure um, that's a bivector. The tangent bundle simply by pushing forward uh, with the anchor. And then we can note that um, if we started with a non-degenerate pi, so we picked pi so that it was invertible as a section of uh, the square of uh, the Lie algebra, and we push that forward, then it will still be non-degenerate almost everywhere, except it degenerates on the vanishing locus uh, of the divisor. And so th yeah, this is exactly uh, the kind of uh, Poisson structure that comes from a stable generalized complex structure, where the uh, divisor has a particular type. Oh, where's the
So we call the divisor elliptic if this vanishing locus is a co-dimension two submanifold smooth and um, the section sigma has positive definite normal Hessian around D. So what this essentially means is that locally sigma looks like R squared where R theta are normal polar coordinates to D. So the, we write the Lie algebroid that's associated to this, which we call the elliptic tangent bundle, uh, like this. So this right now doesn't look like generalized complex geometry. So here's a theorem by um, Gilles Cavalcanti and Marco Gualtieri. So a non-degenerate um, Lie algebraic Poisson structure for this uh, Lie algebraic um, is in fact uh, induced by a generalized complex structure. if and only if, first of all, um, D needs to be co-oriented. So uh, the normal bundle to D is oriented, which is equivalent to saying that uh, ND is actually a complex line bundle. So for uh, like a real plane bundle being oriented and being complex is the same thing. Um, and then uh, there is a condition for the inverse of uh, pi, which we suggestively write as omega. So this is like a symplectic form uh, for this Lie algebraid. And um, uh, this needs to satisfy the following. So I've written here del del theta and r del del r. So if we take coordinates with these polar coordinates normal to D, and then um, for the rest of the coordinates, maybe coordinates on D, then del del theta and r del del r are precisely the local uh, generators for uh, this Lie algebraid that are not just tangent to D. Yeah, so that's what the structure looks like. And we require that whenever we put both of these into omega and pull that back to D, that vanishes. So this is called the elliptic residue. And essentially what this says is that, um, yeah, so this is not exactly right, but basically it says that the omega should not contain um, terms like this. So, um, yeah, I guess I need to write like this. Okay, the statement continues, I guess. So the pair of this Poisson structure together with the choice of co-orientation for the normal, uh, so co-orientation for D are in one-to-one -one correspondence with gauge equivalence classes. Yeah? So 
so it needs to, so time something smooth that then pulls back to zero on D. Yes, that can, that can happen, so. Okay, so pairs of Poisson structure with co-orientation of D and one-to-one -one correspondence with gauge equivalence classes um, of stable GC structures. So the definition for a stable GC structure is then in the way that I've set it up simply that it is one that induces such a Poisson structure. So uh, generally for simplicity in this talk, I'm um, sometimes going to assume that D is connected. So this is not, like, this is not essential. It's just going to make things easier with writing if I do that. So consider from now on uh, D to be connected. So, uh, several people here in the audience uh, may already have seen another instance of uh, a divisor Poisson structure, actually the, the one that's probably uh, more wi widely known in the Poisson geometry community, uh, namely log symplectic or log Poisson structures. So this is basically due to Radko. Miranda Pirish, and by now many other people have published about this. So, log Poisson or log symplectic structures arise from a divisor use uh, sigma such that the section sigma actually intersects the zero section transversely. So somehow vanishes linearly. Um, this immediately implies that the vanishing locus is of co-dimension one, so hypersurface and smooth. And so then if we pick a non-degenerate pi, Um, the resulting pull, uh, pushed forward Poisson structure on the original tangent bundle has the property that when you take its nth power, that also intersects the zero section transversely. So several people may have seen this already. Um, and there's a nice local description. So locally, Z is going to be given by the vanishing of a linear function, and in fact, uh, in the examples that we're interested in, this uh, degeneracy locus Z will be a boundary, so it is in fact globally given uh, by the vanishing of such a function. And then, again, the inverse of pi, which is this uh, Lie algebraic symplectic form, looks like this, dx over x, which another one form, plus another two form, which we can also write as d log x, so hence the name alpha plus beta. Where we can um, arrange this so that alpha and beta are actually forms that get pulled back from z to a tubular neighborhood. Okay. So 
So now as part of my thesis, I showed that in fact uh, stable generalized complex structures are equivalent to certain uh, log symplectic structures by real oriented blow up of the degeneracy locus. So have I already written it? You know, I've, it's still there. So for a stable generalized complex structure, the degeneracy locus D is of co-dimension two. And what we can now do is perform a real oriented blow up. This means we take out D and replace it by its normal sphere bundle. The result is a manifold with boundary. And this blown up manifold then inherits a particular type of log symplectic structure. So what does this look like? So here's the original manifold with the degeneracy locus D inside and these types of normal polar coordinates. And then there's the blown up manifold with boundary with the blown up locus D inside. So where we still have a coordinate theta, and this is now actually a proper circle coordinate for the um, S1 bundle that we replaced um, D by. So a stable GC structure, which is a pair of one of these elliptic Poisson symplectic structures and the co-orientation of D. is equivalent to, so first of all, this co-orientation of D, which defines a complex structure on the normal bundle to D, um, that corresponds to having a principal U1 bundle structure on this blown up locus D tilde. whose action vector field is given by del and del theta um, in the way that I've written it. So what you can see is that, so somehow the complexity that was before in the normal bundle to D um, now gets replaced by something in D itself. So D is now a non in general non-trivial principle U1 bundle, but the normal bundle to D tilde, the blown up locus is of course trivial because it's a boundary. Um, and then the conditions on this uh, Lie algebra symplectic form translate to the following. So there's a log symplectic omega tilde which is a pullback in some, so in a well-defined sense this is a pullback of this original um, omega over here and it has to satisfy, so by virtue of being a pullback, it satisfies the following conditions. So first of all, this is a direct translation of the vanishing of the elliptic residue over there. So if we put R del del R, which is now actually here a global vector field around D um, into omega tilde and pull the result back to, to D tilde, and then we put in the action vector field of the U1 action, this has to vanish, and then there's a second condition where if we just put in the action vector field and restrict to D tilde, uh, this form has to be closed. So, what 
what this does for us in the context of today's talk is that it gives us a nice description of what the manifold looks like if I remove the degeneracy locus. So this is a genuine symplectic manifold. And it has a cylindrical end that's diffeomorphic to yeah, d tilde with an open cylinder end. And so recall I'd already written down this form if I originally had um, a symplectic form, uh, log symplectic form omega tilde uh, like this, where R was the radial coordinate that's zero at the degeneracy locus and then grows as you go further inside um, M. We can um, replace this by a coordinate T minus, which is equal to minus log R to write this as symplectic form like this. OK, why did I do this transformation? Because I wanted t to actually go from some positive number to infinity, um, where we've now removed um, the degeneracy locus where r was 0. Um, so I've already yeah, said this before. This is a genuine one form on d tilde. It's, in fact, just um, what I wrote over there. So if I put r, del and del r into omega and pull that back to d tilde, I get alpha. That's also what you can see from over here. And then beta is, a leave -wise, uh, is the leave-wise symplectic form um, for the Poisson structure that's induced on or like for the restriction of the Poisson structure to um, d tilde. So these are, they yeah, have a bunch of relations. So first of all, because we knew that um, omega tilde was non-degenerate, we get that alpha wedge beta to the n minus 1 is 0. I'm going to denote this by condition A. Then since omega tilde was closed, we also get that alpha and beta are closed. So this is condition B. And lastly, in particular, uh, this is in, in this case a trivial condition. We get that the kernel of beta is contained in the kernel of d alpha. That's condition C. forms alpha beta, so that's a one form and a two form, is called a stable Hamiltonian system if it satisfies A, B, and C. Now, this is obviously a special kind of stable Hamiltonian system because um, alpha is closed. But um, you all may be more familiar with a different special example of stable Hamiltonian, um, stable Hamiltonian system or stable Hamiltonian structure, namely um, the ones arising from a Liouville manifold, so an exact symplectic manifold. Um, what does that look like?
so if we have an exact symplectic manifold um, with a complete a Liouville vector field, so the Liouville vector field is the vector field Z such that when I put it into omega, I get theta. Um, so this needs to be complete and outward pointing at infinity. Then um, this manifold also has cylindrical ends with a stable Hamiltonian structure. Namely, so N can be viewed as gluing a compact piece with a contact boundary to, well, this kind of cylindrical end. And um, so the restriction of theta to this boundary, which I write as alpha, um, is a contact structure. What does that mean? That means alpha wedge d alpha to the n minus 1 is non-zero. So if I take the pair alpha d alpha, that also satisfies the three condition um, a, b, c that are highlighted over there. So this is yeah, the, the most um, well-known example of a stable Hamiltonian structure, and it's also um, somehow a guiding example of what I try to do with the stable Hamiltonian structures induced by log symplectic structures. Of course, you can see that in some sense, these two examples are at yeah, opposite ends of the spectrum of stable Hamiltonian structures in that here, the alpha is maximally non-integrable and in the other case, uh, alpha is closed. So in that sense, they're very different. So now we need one more piece. So for any stable Hamiltonian structure, there's a reap vector field. So this is also something people may know from um, contact geometry. And this is the unique vector field that pairs to one with alpha. and it's in the kernel of beta. So, So I'm interested in particular types of um, pseudo-holomorphic um, maps from Riemann surfaces into this kind of um, yeah, cylindrical uh, symplectic manifold. So um, I'm not the first one to do this. So there's already a paper by Davide Alboresi who describes this, uh, yeah, who explains this description of log symplectic structures in terms of stable Hamiltonian systems. And he also looks at uh, yeah, closed pseudo-holomorphic curves in this type of manifold, as well as some that have punctures. And so what I'm interested in is, in particular, uh, pseudo-holomorphic strips that um, yeah, that somehow map in between Lagrangians that are contained into, in these manifolds. So we have this um, cylindrical manifold. I'm going to continue writing it like this. And it's equipped with 
with this type of symplectic structure. Um, then we can consider Lagrangians. And the easiest type of Lagrangian to consider is also in some sense cylindrical. So the Lagrangian is also a product of a manifold del L uh, with R, where del L is contained in the tilde such that both alpha and beta pull back to zero on it. then you can easily see that this is, in fact, a Lagrangian submanifold. So now, um, when doing Lagrangian intersection Fleur theory, which is ultimately what I'm interested in here, um, you need the Lagrangians in question to intersect transversely. This is, of course, uh, never the case if you take two Lagrangians like this. So what we need to do is perturb one of them with a Hamiltonian. So we take the function uh, t prime squared. So t prime is the coordinate uh, for the cylinder coordinate. We can take its time one flow. And we can um, move one of the Lagrangians. What that does is the further out in the cylinder we get, the more the Lagrangian gets wrapped around uh, the cylindrical end and we produce an infinite number of um, yeah, now transverse intersections. So, to write this on the next part. intersection points of well, L0 and the perturbed version of L1 are in fact in one-to-one -one correspondence with um, reports. So what's that? That are just integral curves of the re vector field from del L0 to del L1 in D tilde. So why is this? Um, we've chosen a particularly nice um, Hamiltonian. So dH is 2 T prime dT prime. So the Hamiltonian vector field of this particular function is a multiple of the, the read vector field. Um, OK. So um, what kind of pseudo-holomorphic maps are we interested in? So in order to construct Lagrangian intersection Fleur theory. Um, we consider uh, pseudo-holomorphic strips. So those are maps from a strip across the interval. Into the manifold.
such that the image of the strip lands between two Lagrangians, so with the boundary in either Lagrangian, and the ends limiting to an intersection point on each side. So, Holomorphic means that this map satisfies a partial differential equation of this form. Where this J is a compa compatible or maybe a tame um, almost complex structure. So these kinds of maps, so many different types of uh, pseudo-holomorphic maps, are studied in symplectic geometry in several sort of related contexts. So gromov witten invariants are about counting these things. Then there's all the different versions of Fleur theory um, and symplectic field theory. So, um, yeah, there's always quite a lot of uh, technical um, details that you need to keep track of when uh, looking at these kinds of maps. So in particular, an important result um, by Gromov is sort of the Gromov compactness theorem. Which tells us that under the right circumstances, moduli spaces of these kinds of maps are actually nice. So in particular, if we're in a compact manifold, and we pay attention to how we choose J, and we maybe let it depend on the curve on the T coordinate, uh, then the moduli space of such pseudo holomorphic strips is smooth and can be compactified to a manifold with boundary, where the boundary components we need to put in are sort of three versions of degenerate strips that are not. Yeah, that, that can, we can um, that we can enumerate. So the three different types of degeneracy that we get are called sphere bubbling. So we're somehow in the middle of a disk, a pseudo holomorphic S two bubbles off. Disk bubbling where on a boundary component, a pseudo-holomorphic disk bubbles off. And then lastly, strip breaking, where in the limit, the pseudo-holomorphic disks goes through another intersection point of two manifolds. So when defining um, Fleur cohomology, we somehow need to exclude these from happening, otherwise um, it doesn't work or there are complications. Whereas this is actually an essential part of the construction and it makes the eventual Fleur differential square to zero. So now the context that I've been talking about both uh, Liouville manifolds and log symplectic manifolds are non compact. So there is an additional um, complication that we need to uh, keep in mind. Um, namely, 
So when we consider families of pseudo-holomorphic strips in these perturbed Lagrangians, somehow the disk could start going off to infinity and limit to something that has a puncture where the puncture yeah, moves off to infinity. And this is somehow a case we need to exclude if we want to set up any kind of Fleur theory. And so both, so in the case of uh, Liouville manifolds, this is a well-known well result that these kinds of things don't happen. And it turns out that in the log symplectic case, we can also exclude this from happening with a similar sort of argument, um, namely a maximum principle argument. So I have a little bit of time left. Let me see so how much I can say about this. So So first of all, because we've done this, um, yeah, in, the, in this case, large perturbation with the Hamiltonian, the pseudo-holomorphic disks uh, that we're considering now uh, satisfy a different uh, equation. And instead of viewing them as being between the intersection points of the Lagrangians, I would want to use this Reeb chord picture. So where at either end, the strip limits towards a Reeb chord connecting the two Lagrangians. The modified um, flow equation, yeah, I'm going to write in coordinates. The modified flow equation that this satisfies now looks like this. So there's this extra term uh, with the Hamiltonian vector field. Um, what we want to do in order for this to work is to choose J to be uh, compatible with the cylindrical structure. So um, J should be cylindrical. And in particular, this means that dt prime um, composed with J is equal to minus alpha, which is essentially um, yeah, a way of saying that when we take J of the cylindrical vector field, we get the Reeb vector field. Um, And then in order to uh, ensure that no pseudo-holomorphic strip goes off to infinity, we consider this function. So it's simply um, the map for the strip composed with the coordinates along the cylinder direction. And we need to ensure that this function takes its maximum essentially at, at one of the Reeb chords, so at either end of the image where we want the strip to map and that there is nothing that goes further out. So this proceeds in two steps. We can calculate the following. So d rho composed with little j, which denotes the complex structure on the strip. Is in fact the same thing is minus used to alpha plus two rho um, dt. Okay, now this is why I wrote t prime. So this t is one of the coordinates on the strip, like I wrote down over there, the coordinate for the uh, interval from zero to one. So this is this is a bit of a calculation.
So by differentiating once further, we can get this uh, second order differential equation, which in local coordinates on the strip just looks like Laplacian of rho plus 2 del rho in del s equals 0. This is in particular an elliptic PDE, so the maximum principle applies. And we can say, OK, the maximum that this function takes lies somewhere on the boundary of the strip, so somewhere uh, inside one of the bounding Lagrangians. And as a last step, what we need to exclude is that the strip somehow goes off to infinity inside one of the Lagrangians, which it could because the Lagrangians go off to infinity. Um, and that is excluded as follows. So we assume we have a maximum at P. Then certainly at that point, the derivative of rho with respect to S has to be 0. And we can now calculate that, in fact, the derivative of rho with respect to p, at, uh, yeah, with respect to t at that point, um, is also zero. And now we can use this previous equation that we had to have a contradiction. So, if both of these are true, and we also know that the second derivative of rho with respect to s is smaller than zero, which it has to be for it to be a maximum, um, then this equation would imply that the second derivative of rho with respect to t is bigger than zero, but then we do not have a maximum of rho but a saddle point, so this is a contradiction. And so we can ensure that just like for Liouville manifolds, uh, log symplectic manifolds, and their stable Hamiltonian structure are nice enough that, at the very least, this complication doesn't arise. So now, in order to actually define wrapped Fleur theory, there are many other complications that I have not yet worked out, but maybe next time. Thank you.